Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada, and uh, I'm shooting from the Lugnuts facility. And what we have here is uh, a very nice example of uh, the first generation of Honda S2000 Roadsters. This one is a 2002 model year. It's also known as an AP1, which differentiates it from the uh, revised uh, S2000, which went into production uh, for 2004. So the AP1s with the two liter engine and the 9,000 RPM red line were produced in the model years 2000, 01, 02, and 03. And this is one of those examples. So we'll do um, a pretty thorough uh, narrated walk around video of the car. Uh, we'll address, um, well, very, virtually every square inch of the car. So we'll go through the exterior, interior, undercarriage. We'll do a paint meter report. We'll go through the uh, Carfax um, and the uh, provenance of the car, the servicing of the car. And we'll try to make this relevant, in, in other words, to, to the potential purchaser. Um, uh, the, the areas of, of a sports car and an S2000 in particular which I think you might want to pay special attention to, which, which we'll emphasize. Um, all of my videos uh, are long and they're thorough, but it's, it's done with a particular aim for a potential buyer who may be thinking about sending a large amount of money to somebody they don't know for a car they haven't seen, maybe in a different country. So when you apply that standard to the documentation and presentation, what we believe, anyway, that the buyer wants, wants to see is basically for us to go through every square inch of the car, leaving no kind of stone unturned, and get, you know, two or three hundred photographs, a complete review of the provenance and documentation on the Carfax and the maintenance history, uh, get a look at the car on the hoist, etc., etc. So these videos take a while, you know, maybe 40 minutes to an hour or something. We follow that up with a cold start video, driving video, compression test, video of the top operation, and really try to put every possible thing in the video. So if you're thinking about buying the car and you've watched all of the footage, you really shouldn't have any questions at all, although we're happy to answer them if, if you do. Um, to help navigate through the video, it's broken down into sections with a table of contents. So if you just want to fast forward to the driving video or the paint meter review or the undercarriage or whatever it is, feel free to skip ahead uh, or take in the video in um, different sections. So we'll start with a brief overview of the S2000. I'll, I'll keep that relatively modest in length because you know there's entire books on the subject if you, if you want to do a deeper dive. Um, then we'll get into a walk around of the exterior. Uh, we'll follow that up with a paint meter We'll go through the interior, engine compartment trunk, then we'll lift the car on the hoist. We'll do a detailed video of the undercarriage of the car. We'll go through the paperwork, uh, servicing, provenance, uh, and then we'll uh, end it with a driving video. Although the weather's not too great at the moment, so that'll probably be a separate video, maybe part two. Okay, so. So forgive a little bit of uh, a personal story here on the S2000. Um, selling this car is a collaboration between Lugnuts uh, and myself, Romanowski Automotive. Um, Lugnuts is the shop we work out of, and we do all kinds of work on classic uh, and specialty cars, buying and selling, restorations, servicing. And we've had everything through here from a Model T Ford to uh, late model Exotica. Um, the owner of Lugnuts is a guy named George. He's a friend of mine. We met racing when we were in Solo One competition and we were both racing uh, Integra Type R's. And we used to race at Race City together. And we're pretty competitive. Um, that was in the late 90s and we were both, and still are, sort of rabid Honda fans. Um, and uh, when the news of the S2000 broke, um, I remember 
reading absolutely everything I could on it. The internet was in its infancy, and you could pull up various um, uh, uh, press bulletins and so forth on this car. And <clears throat> I remember we were all super excited that it came out. At that time, the Integra Type R had the highest specific output of any naturally aspirated motor on sale in North America at 107 horsepower per liter. The only other car that came close to that was a Ferrari F355 with five, valve per, five valves per cylinder and a lot more expensive, obviously. So this came out and the reports are that it had 120 horsepower per liter, which was, you know, like far more than anything else. Like it was, it was an ex extraordinary number and an extraordinary claim for a two liter engine to produce 240 horsepower. Of course, the only way you can get high horsepower if your engine's naturally aspirated and of a, a limited size is, is engine revolutions. Horsepower being the torque, which is limited by displacement, if it's normally aspirated, times the revs. So an Integra Type R had, I think it was an 8,600 RPM red line, and the fuel cutout was, well, I think 8,800 is what I shifted it at. Well, this was a, an honest 9,000 RPM engine, and that was just absolutely spectacular. 20 years later, Porsche came out with a GT3 that also revved to 9,000. And I think the, the Lexus LFA also revs to that amount. But even something like a, a Porsche Carrera GT doesn't rev to 9,000 RPM. So it was really an, an, an exciting and an exceptional vehicle. And there were lots of comparisons between it and the BMW Z3 and the Porsche Boxster and the Mercedes SLK. Uh, there was a whole bunch of small roadsters introduced at that time. But my favorite was always the S2000. And, and George, in fact, bought one. I couldn't afford it back then. Um, so uh, it was a groundbreaking car. It was a huge uh, technological achievement at the time. And it was a very important car for Honda. They, of course, started out making sports cars in the 60s um, with Shoshiro Honda developing the S600 and the S800. And they had 600cc chain-driven, four-carb, really, really exotic motorcycle engines, basically, in the cars. And they, they're, you know, everybody described um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the precision and the quality of those Honda engines. And Honda at that time was running all the Grand Prix bike races. And so they took all of that technical knowledge and put it in their motorcycles and then in the first Honda sports cars. In the 90s, Honda was big into F1 racing. And in the early 90s, uh, completely dominated F1 with their V12 and V10 uh, engines. Uh, Gordon Murray designed uh, monocoque tubs and drivers like Ayrton Senna um, and Prost. One year they won 15 of 16 races, which I guess we see that now with Verstappen. But in that era, Honda completely dominated like F1 racing. Um, so Honda, and, and they had a real spirit of engineering. They would have teams of engineers and they'd send them out to go to F1, not necessarily to win the F1 race, which they, they did anyway, but to just to learn and to be part of the environment. But they also sent a team to go make a robot, which was the Asimo robot, a team to um, make, a, make a plane. And so they made the Honda Jet. Uh, in that era, they also sent a team to make really exotic mountain bikes with, uh, with actual gear transmissions instead of derailers. So whatever the pro, they never even sold the bikes. Um, so whatever the project was, they just had the spirit of innovation and quality engineering, and they went out to just, you know, prove themselves and make some of the, the you know, the, the best products in the world. And they did that in the, in, the, in the 90s and in the 2000s. Not sure they do it today, but back then they did. So 
I mean, it started with the Honda NSX in 1990, which, which, which you know, rewrote the rules for, for supercars and made the Italian exotics just look clumsy and silly. Um, and uh, they followed it up with this car, the S2000. There was also the, the Honda Insight, um, which was made in the same plant, um, and, and the same plant as the NSX, which were exquisite pieces of engineering. So where I'm getting with all this is the S2000 was made as uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Honda Motor Company. It was a successor to the small displacement S600 and S800 sports cars. It used the very best kind of cost, no objects, engineering purity from a company led by engineers trying to make the very best, purest cars or planes or bikes or whatever, robots or whatever they wanted to do, um, make, make the best examples extant, okay? And so that, that same thinking went into the NSX, it went into the S2000, it went into the first Insight, it went into the Honda Jet, it went into the Honda Insight, and that company was uh, really special. All right, just my opinion. Anyway, so what you got um, was you got a steel car with some aluminum panels, double wishbone suspension on all four corners. Uh, you got a rigid, uh, they call it an X-frame, but a, but a very rigid center tunnel uh, to keep all the suspension accurate. Uh, you have an engine that um, is placed well back in the chassis, well behind the, the, uh, the front axle, uh, a close ratio six-speed gearbox, a Torsen limited slip differential, um, and then you have uh, all the tuning, which is done not for numbers, but from uh, a holistic approach to make the car invigorating and, and fun to drive. So it has one of the first cars to have electric power steering, which nobody thought anything of back then. Now it's kind of a thing. People complain about it, but the, 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 the steering on the car is razor sharp and was praised in period. Um, kind of proving that the whole controversy over electric power steering was, I think, just made up in the media. Um, I, I don't know. Doesn't make any sense to me, but um, uh, there's a and it has some electrically driven ancillary components to um, not rob power from the engine. Uh, it uh, we have a cockpit which is quite confined, uh, but uh, very minimal movement from the gear selector. The steering rack is really sharp feedback, and then like I said, double wishbone suspension, and of course all the tuning bits that you'd expect to get 120 horsepower per liter, including the intake and the exhaust, uh, the exhaust system and so forth, and the engine internals designed to um, withstand 9,000 RPM, forged crank, forged aluminum pistons, low friction valve train, et cetera, et cetera. So a really special piece. Uh, they made about 110,000 of them, I think. Most of these cars were used pretty hard. Um, many were modified, many were tracked, many were crashed. Uh, and so finding an AP1 that doesn't have any modifications, that's had sympathetic ownership, um, that hasn't been uh, wrecked or stolen is actually quite rare. And uh, we're, very, we're very pleased to find this one. Um, okay, so let's go on. That's about the S2000, and let's go on to this particular example. This 2002 S2000 started life in the US. Uh, it was an American car. They're mechanically identical, but it started life in the US. Uh, it went through a couple dealers' hands. Uh, it was then imported into Canada in 2011 and it went to Lethbridge. Uh, and Lethbridge is noteworthy, part of the southern, like southernmost part of Alberta. It gets a lot of sun and it's very dry. Okay. Uh, it uh, it uh, was in Lethbridge, well, until now. 
uh, and uh, the current owner's uh, neighbor owned the car and was the one that imported it. And then the neighbor was selling the car and he just bought it from his neighbor. And the current owner is a retired pilot and he's had the car for 10 years in Lethbridge and he sold it to us. The previous owner was mechanically adept. Um, he did his own work on his cars and his planes and we have the full service manual for the, for the S2000 that comes with the car. And um, this guy did his own uh, maintenance. It really, he really didn't do too much to the car other than uh, uh, fluid changes. Uh, he did install a new canvas soft top and he did install new headlights. Um, and that's about it. The, the car didn't require any other uh, mechanical servicing. Um, if you're concerned about the quality or the thoroughness of somebody who's doing their own maintenance, uh, you can be somewhat assured that he also put uh, new wings on his beach craft. So the way I look at it is if you have a guy who can put new wings on a plane and then fly it, he can change the oil in your car. So that's the way I look at it. Anyway, so uh, we've just recently got the car at Lugnuts and we've gone through it. Mostly what we did is we just blew all the dust off of it um, and cleaned it up. Uh, we bought new tires for it and we'll, we've done the um, uh, fresh fluid changes on the car. Other than that, we really didn't need to do anything to the car. Let's go through it panel by panel on the exterior. I'll pick out any imperfections and then we'll run over the car with the paint meter to check the paint depth. Uh, so we'll start with the front bumper cover and um, I mean it presents well but you can tell there are some marks on it. We've got a touched up scratch here uh, we've got a little bit of stone pitting on the lower edge. Um, I have a video of the undercarriage which shows, you know, a little bit, uh, these plastic pieces are a little bit chewed up down there, but you, you can see that better with the car in the air. Um, we don't have any dents in the bumper cover. We don't have any cracks in the bumper cover. And uh, there's no evidence that it's ever been repaired. It just has, you know, a few marks as you'd expect. Um, 428,000 kilometers and um, you know if these bumper covers get hit often the plastic brackets will break and you'll see you know different size gaps in the uh, between it and the fender or they'll be loose in some way so there's there's none of that with this uh, with this bumper cover um, it uh, it's got a few chips in it and a few scratches in it but it's never been damaged and repaired uh, and there's no damage underneath the car. Okay. <coughs> so the bonnet uh, looks good. I believe it is aluminum. Let's just check that. Yeah, it's non-ferrous. So the, the, the hood on this is aluminum. Um, and uh, we don't really see any uh, n really noticeable uh, stone chips. Um, there's a couple, uh, but uh, nothing of any real, real significance. I suppose that's the worst one right there. Another one here. And another one there. One there too. Okay. The um, driver's side front fender, uh, we can see the leading edge has a couple chips. Uh, they've been filled in. Uh, there's no scratches or they're dents. And, <clears throat> and the front fender, uh, the front fenders are steel. <clears throat> the doors are also steel. And let's just complete that the trunk lid is steel. So we've got an aluminum bonnet and everything else appears to be steel. Um, on the door panel and the sill, 
Uh, I can't really see anything. Um, there's no door dings. Everything's straight. Uh, I don't see any scuffing or scratches. Sometimes the trailing edge of the door, we can see it's a little bit marked up there. If the door gets, there's a few little chips down here. So we can see a little bit of chipping on the trailing edge of the door where it might have rested up against something. Um, but we can't actually see it if the door is closed. Um, the sill, if we look at it, uh, there's no damage to the sill. Um, it's completely straight and no scratches. The rear quarter as well uh, looks free of any scratches or blemishes. And looking down the side of the car, and we can just get, get the camera over here, um, the side of the car looks completely straight. We don't see any door dings. Uh, we don't see any waviness of the panels. The rear trunk lid, uh, we don't really see any marks on that. Not that its rear trunk is susceptible to uh, getting stone chips. And the rear bumper cover, um, this piece we know has been replaced uh, because it doesn't have a VIN sticker on it. All the other panels have the original VIN stickers except for the rear bumper. Um, so we know this piece has been replaced and repainted and there's no scuffing on it. The lower valence uh, looks, uh, looks, looks fine. Of course, we expect it to look fine. There's not much that's gonna happen to it. And the exhaust tips uh, came out really nicely after just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, steel wool. Um, headlamp and tail, the, the headlamps are new and the lenses are all um, uh, unfaded and uncracked. And lights can be expensive, so that's actually kind of important. Uh, looking down uh, the passenger side, again, I do not see any door dings or waviness in the panels or dents or scratches. Uh, it looks perfectly straight uh, to me. Uh, I'll call out this um, touched up area here where something contacted the plastic uh, bumper cover, okay? And I'm not sure what that little black spot is. We could touch that up. Okay. Uh, the uh, passenger rear quarter, uh, again, looks perfect. There's nothing there. The passenger door, there's no door dings. There's no scratches. There's no marks the sill, there's no damage there. Uh, it looks perfect. I suppose there's a little tiny mark there. Okay. And then uh, we have the front fender. And I guess we have a few on the, on the leading edge of the front fender. Again, we have a couple of stone chips, uh, which, were, which we expect with uh, this mileage on the car. For the exterior trim, rubber and glass and so on, uh, the badge looks nice. There's not a lot of trim on an S2000. Um, I don't see any chunks taken out of the, uh, of the, uh, the radiator grill, and that can sometimes happen. It gets a bird or an animal or something like that. The headlamps are new. Um, and uh, so, of course, you'd expect those to be next to perfect, and, uh, and they are. Uh, the windshield uh, is recent. Uh, there are a few little pits in it that we can pick up. Hmm. Uh, nothing, that, nothing that's cracked or uh, spidering, uh, but I think the windshield's only a couple years old. It just, in Alberta, there's lots of rocks, so if you drive the car, you're going to get stone chips. Um, I don't see any of the paint chipping off the wiper arms, and the uh, wiper blades still feel uh, reasonably supple. Uh, if we want to come over here, uh, the badge is in good shape. There's no cracking or fading of the signal light. Uh, three 
three of the four rims are perfect. One of them has a couple marks in it. This is the one with a little bit of curb rash. We can see that there, and we can see that there. Of course, we, as we always do, we, uh, we clean the inside of the wheels too, and uh, uh, that makes a big difference as to their appearance. Um, for tires, there aren't too many tires, speed rated 16 inch tires. These are a Bridgestone Potenza. Uh, they're quite an aggressive tire. They're very sticky. Um, they're, I guess what we used to call, or close to our compound tires. I know when you move the car, uh, you can hear this kind of like sound like masking tape. <laughs> so, uh, uh, there's not too many cars that are going to go around a corner faster than this Honda with these uh, Potenza RE71 RS tires, okay? The mirrors are in good shape. You know, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll, they'll pick up a chip or a crack from, from hitting something. That's not the case here. Uh, sometimes if, if a person has rings or sharp nails, I guess, you know, you can see a bunch of uh, scratches where the door handle is, and uh, we don't see that here. Uh, we can see the passenger side uh, wheel uh, looks excellent with no curb rash. Okay, nothing unusual there. You know, if the, if the car has been painted, you'll see, often see lines, masking lines, and so on. Uh, the uh, rear tail, tail lights are not faded, not cracked. The third row brake light works and is in excellent shape. Uh, the passenger side tail light is, uh, uh, is in good shape. There's no problems with the antenna mast. And the exterior trim, uh, you know, all, all looks good. This can get faded uh, from the sun. Uh, and uh, we don't we don't uh, we don't see that here. Uh, maybe now is a good time to put up the soft top and demonstrate that. It's a, a new soft top, um, and it's canvas. Most of them are uh, most of them are vinyl that looks like canvas, but this one is an actual canvas top. So I'll demonstrate the soft top. You pull the emergency brake. And that's pretty fast. So the automatic part gets you to here. And then you press this button in. And well, like this couldn't be easier. And then to undo it, we'll do that. And this. And we'll push it back. All right, so that works well. On the car, measure the paint depth of all of the steel and aluminum panels. Um, and mostly what we're looking for is consistency. Um, and um, what we don't want to see is like massive variations that indicate a lot of filler from an improperly repaired accident. That's the main thing. Um, but it also gives us an indication of what's original paint and where the car has received some paintwork. There's a little bit of detective work um, uh, because you, don't, you can't know exactly what happened to the car. Um, but when we read the paint meter readings, we can infer certain things. I set, this, I set this up to read in micrometers, which is uh, one one hundredth of a millimeter. So when the car is brand new and painted, uh, and, you know, painted at the factory, we expect paint meter readings of about, between about 100 to 200 micrometers. And different manufacturers put different thicknesses of paint on, Sometimes aluminum panels get thicker uh, uh, paint than, uh, than steel panels. Um, but generally, it's in the range of you know, 125 to 200. I can demonstrate this by doing a paint meter on a, a late model Porsche that's only a couple of years old that hasn't had anything done to the roof, and it's 164. 
and that's about what we expect, okay? Let's look at this Honda S2000, and we'll start on the front fender. 178, 193, 163, 181, 149, 122, 118, 130, 130, 122, 176. So in my estimation, this side of the car is all original paint. For a body shop to repaint a panel, generally it's gonna be at least 300 micrometers, okay? Um, that all being said, some panels are stripped to bare metal and painted. Sometimes the body shop just sands the paint that's there and paints over top. Sometimes one panel might be painted, but it's blended, so part of another panel gets a little bit of paint and or a little bit of clear. So when you, when you get numbers in the mid 100s, you can really be quite certain that it's original paint. When you get numbers in the low 200s, I generally assume that to be the original paint, but maybe with some clear blown over it. And so if I get a number of, let's, let's say in the low 200s, I might expect the panel next to it to have a higher number. Okay, with that in mind, let's continue here. And we have a trunk lid now, and now we're up to 219 to 219, 219, 221, and 228. So it's hard to know about the trunk panel. We know that the rear bumper cover has been replaced because it doesn't have the, uh, the VIN sticker on it. We know from the Carfax that there is, uh, there's no damage estimate, but there is a a line of an accident of some sort, which we attribute to the fact that it needed a new bumper cover. Now, 200, in my opinion, is probably too thin for a repaint at the body shop, but it could very well be that it's re-cleared and it's a light re-clearing, which explains the difference between the, you know, the, the one 115 here and the 246 there. So that's, that's not even a tenth of a millimeter, um, but that could very well be clear. So we think that uh, the car was in a mild rear end collision that necessitated a, a new rear bumper cover and a re-clearing of the trunk. If I can't do a paint meter on the bumper cover because it's plastic. Uh, if we continue, 145, 131, 167, 151, 176, 143, 171, 130, 186, 188, 175, 190, 149. So again, that's too thin in my opinion for this car to have been repainted on this side. I'm calling the car for original paint. Um, there's parts of this fender which are a little bit thicker. And if I do the bonnet, I get 244, 377, 404, 387, 374, 359, 369, 
386, 401, 355. Okay, so that's pretty clear to me. The bonnet has been repainted. It's all even, um, and uh, you know, so it, it's a quality paint job. You can't really tell anything by looking at it, but um, we can, we definitely know the bonnet's been repainted, and there's a little bit of extra thickness the difference between 150 and 180 and 400 micrometers that I believe is part of this panel being blended and a little bit of clear blown up over the top. So uh, with what I know about paint meters and paint and cars and I'm doing it a thousand times, um, I would call this car for a repaint of the bonnet, a new rear bumper cover and a re-clear of the rear trunk lid uh, and some blending that goes into maybe the top of the car, the top of the fenders next to the trunk lid and the bonnet. Best of my ability, I believe that uh, that's what's been done to this car. Others could have a different opinion, but I'm pretty confident that this is the case with this Honda. Okay, so let's do the interior. Um, first impressions are excellent. Uh, now when we get in the car, sometimes, you know, if, especially if the car has been driven in the winter, at least in, in Alberta, uh, lots of different rocks and gravel and so on will get in the car and then you'll really chew up this uh, sill area. Um, and that's not the case here, presumably, because it was never driven in. We're good? Yep. Okay, so if we get a good look at the carpet here, it's black, so it's kind of hard to tell. We can, see that, we can see that it's still all in excellent shape. And we see the, the race-style pedals with the rubber grommets and, you know, the aluminum, the aluminum surfacing. All looks good. Uh, a lot of the Japanese cars use pretty thin carpets, and if a person doesn't keep their car clean, and there's a lot of dirt and gravel and so on in the carpets, the, that dirt acts as an abrasive, and you can really wreck the carpets pretty quick, and then they don't come back. So we, we, we just don't see that with this car. It, you know, obviously, pretty easy to come to the conclusion that it was a fair weather car, uh, and as such has never been really dirty, and then the dirt hasn't worn out the carpets or scratched the sill, etc. Um, also, sometimes sports cars, it can be a little bit hard to get in and out of. And this, uh, this panel on the doors, that speaker panel can be vulnerable. Just your, when your foot, your foot can kick it and break it. So we don't see that here. We don't see any scuffing on the door panel. And then if the owner is, let's say, less than limber, you know, you can kind of fall into the seats and um, you can wear out the bolsters uh, actually pretty quickly. Um, and so we see just a light bit of wear on the driver's bolster, um, almost none on the seat base, and there's no scratches or burns or tears on the leather upholstery, and it is you know, still, uh, still supple. Okay, so the, um, the seats are in good shape, the foam in the seats is in good shape, and if we look at the dashboard, um, on, on some cars we can see cracking start to appear, probably not cars from the 2000s, but anyway, um, we've got the dashboard in nice shape, there's no warpage of the plastic, uh, there was nothing that was stuck on or, um, or uh, glued on, uh, which, you can ha which, you, which you see quite a bit with, uh, with Japanese cars. Um, the lever for the, the gear selector, you know, that's not scratched up by rings. And these, uh, and these trim panels look pretty good. We got, uh, maybe we see a little bit of scuffing, you know, on that panel. The cubbies aren't broken. Uh, everything's, of course, clean. Uh, trunk release works. And uh, we can go look at the passenger compartment. And it actually just doesn't look like it was ever, anybody was ever in there. 
everything looks everything looks perfect. So interior of the car is excellent, and of course the soft top is new. And you know, if the soft top leaks or there's holes in it and you get water ingress, you know, you might see that with some corrosion on some of the uh, on some of the mechanisms, and we don't see that at all. Uh, everything back here in the well for the soft top looks in looks in good shape. Uh, the window in this is glass. I'm not sure if the first ones are plastic or not. Uh, trunk area, you know, we can see that the that the uh, VIN stamp is on that panel. Uh, we have the tonneau cover. Uh, which is in good shape, and um, we don't see any we don't see any uh, spills or um, burns or anything like that from battery acid, etc. All of the original tools appear to be in place, and then we have a car cover, and we have a space saver tire which lives up there. Uh, it looks like we took the spare tire out just to fill it up, and it looks uh, it looks unused. So we'll put that back in when we sell the car. Let's have a look under the hood. Okay, so here it is with a red crackle finish on the uh, on the, the valve cover, like all Type R's and uh, like certain Ferraris. Um, we have uh, no leaks uh, the, the detectable, either from the top of the engine uh, or the bottom. We can see that it is um, well back in the chassis. Um, the valve train on this is with uh, gears and chains, so there's no... Um, there's no timing belt that requires uh, frequent uh, changing. Um, and the engine bay generally looks uh, stock and tidy. There is one modification to install the daytime running lights to these headlights. And uh, from that we get an extra one of, I forget which one it is, but an extra one of these uh, uh, sheathed wiring cables that runs to run the daytime running lights. Um, we can see the VIN stamp of the fender on that side and that side. And of course, this would be lost if the fender was to have been repainted. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get that. And so if this fender was repainted, either this would be gone and or you'd see a paint edge here and you don't see it. So that is another reason why I'm confident that the fenders of this car are original. Um, nothing else looks out of place. Um, we can see that because it was an American car, we have the all important uh, emission control and DOT sticker, that's in the door jam, uh, for re-import into the United States. Should that, uh, should that be required, um, because that is, uh, makes life a whole lot easier. That was the EPA sticker, and this is the DOT sticker. Okay, so with those two, you know, the car just sails through uh, the import process. Um, the hood pad still looks good. The fasteners are all in place, and uh, Generally speaking, there's nothing really to uh, nothing really to complain about under the uh, hood of this car. Uh, we can also see the VIN stamped on the firewall, which would be the same number as on the VIN tag, which is the same number on all the body panels. The engine compartment is very clean. You know, if, if I reach down into the bowels of it and run my fingers up, nothing, nothing comes on my fingers. So it's, um, and the 
hoses and all the rubber is still all pretty supple. So um, I don't believe this car was ever subject, subjected to extreme heat. Uh, and there is no uh, evidence of anything uh, rubber that is uh, drying out or cracking. Uh, let's have a look uh, next at some of the documentation uh, that comes with this vehicle. I'm going to come over here. Uh, there is a box of extra parts, uh, you know, an oil filter, the license plate frame, and uh, so on. We have the factory service manual for the car that the previous owner used uh, to do his maintenance. Uh, we can go through the car facts. It'll also be up scanned and uploaded. Um, of note, the, you can look at it in more detail, it came into Canada in April of 2011. There is a note for an accident, a damage event in 2005, uh, but there's no, there's no, um, there's no value uh, associated with that. Um, and then it's in Canada from 2011. Uh, it's had, uh, went through a couple dealers prior to it being imported to Canada. It went into Lethbridge and then was sold to the neighbor of, the, of that guy who sold it to us. Uh, we've got the press release for the S2000, which is kind of interesting. And uh, maybe we'll scan that and put it up too. We don't have a lot of dealer invoices for service work because previous owner did the work himself. And like I said earlier in the video, if he put the wings on his beach craft and flew it, I think you can assume he could change the oil in his S2000 uh, correctly. Uh, so that uh, sums up the uh, exterior and interior. Don't believe I've forgotten anything there. An engine bay. Uh, next we'll go to the undercarriage. Okay, so we have this 2002 Honda S2000 up in the air, and um, that gives us an opportunity uh, to do a close examination of the undercarriage. And so we'll be looking for um, any scrapes uh, on the front bumper, uh, any uh, damage from road debris. Uh, we will check that all of the um, underbody panels are there. Uh, with their correct fasteners. Uh, we'll take a, a special look, uh, examination of, for any evidence of any corrosion. And uh, generally when we you know, do this uh, and we carefully look at all the components and so forth, we get a pretty good idea of what the car has gone through in its life. In fact, I'd actually argue that this video underneath the car is probably more important than the video of the shiny paint uh, because lots of cars have shiny paint, but uh, they can vary quite dramatically uh, when you get a chance to look at them underneath. So let's start with the front spoiler. Uh, to our knowledge, it is original to the car. Um, we can see that it has uh, a little bit of um, scraping. Um, that you would expect um, from a sports car with a low, um, a lo uh, not a lot of ground clearance. Um, but if we look at the integrity of the panel, we can see that it's not uh, cracked and split. I suppose we have this little one here um, and another little one there. Uh, but overall, it's in pretty good shape and all of the fasteners are um, unrusted, um, not corroded, and they're, and they're all present, okay? So again, we have the plastic uh, wheel arch, uh, the inner wheel arch, and we can see, you know, a little bit of uh, chewed up in this vulnerable piece, but at least it's there and not cracked like most of them. And uh, we can see the same piece again on uh, this side. Um, these um, under 
body panels are all present and uh, they look to have all of the fasteners. These, these, um, these fasteners are, you know, they're plastic. You, you pry a screwdriver in there and take them out. And they don't necessarily go back in that well. So it's actually really common uh, to look at especially higher mileage cars um, and just see, you know, a big mess and half of them aren't there and the other half are chewed up and, you know, the under trays are broken and, you know, so on. So this actually looks really good. Um, uh, okay, and then let's just look at the uh, undercarriage in general. Um, you know, we've cleaned it up, um, but we have not, like, you know, got a bunch of rattle cans and, you know, repainted stuff. Um, just to make it look nice in the, in the features, in, in the photos. Um, so the undercarriage has been cleaned, but it still retains all of its original finishes. And uh, this car comes from the U.S. and then made its way uh, to Lethbridge, which is uh, in the lower part of Alberta and particularly dry. Uh, I think I think the... Lethbridge and Medicine Hat areas have more hours of sun and higher temperatures than anywhere else, well, I think in Canada, actually. Okay, so we can look at the brake, um, at the brake lines and the distribution block uh, for those, and we see that the lines are uncorroded. Uh, we see the exhaust, uh, which is a I believe a mild steel exhaust, and it is, uh, well, unusually, I think, just completely uncorroded, um, as are the silencers. Okay, so from the back, the rear bumper cover has been replaced and repainted, um, and uh, uh, it looks in nice shape. There's the odd, I think we have one mark there that's noticeable. Otherwise, it looks, um, you know, as, as new. Exhaust system looks wonderful. Still has the original black paint on the silencers. And we see this rear subframe with the original black paint and, uh, and other uh, markings from the assembly. The rear shocks. And the fasteners for the suspension uh, really doesn't look like anybody's really been in there. It looks all original and, uh, and fresh. We can look through that. Don't believe the car has received um, any suspension work. Okay. The um, wheel arch areas are pristine. And there's, there's no other word for that. It, it looks almost as good as when the car left the factory. And of course, we detailed the uh, backside of, um, of the wheels. If you look up there and in the wheel arches, it just looks brand new in there. And there's certainly, uh, certainly this car uh, you can call rust-free um, with, uh, with confidence. I mean, there's just no corrosion on any part of it. Um, sometimes the floor pans will get dented uh, from road debris or running over something, and we don't see that here. Um, Sometimes the car, you know, these cars are not jacked up properly and uh, they'll have these strengthening ribs uh, for, the, uh, for the floors and people will mistake that for, you know, part of a ladder frame, which of course the car doesn't have a, a ladder frame, it's a monocoque, but they'll use that to jack the car up and, and those will dent because it's just not strong enough. So if, if a car is improperly handled, improperly jacked up, often you'll see these, these uh, strengthening pieces um, dented and so on, so we don't see that. Um, and here we see the pinch welds, uh, which are still um, 
in good shape running along the sill. So these are, again, easily damaged by improper uh, handling. Uh, we can look at the wheel arch and the inner front wheel and get a shot of the alloys are in wonderful shape. A little bit of curb rash on this one, but I think the other ones are actually perfect. That one is. is and that one so just one mark on the rims um, we put new Bridgestone rubber on it uh, just because that was the most similar to what it had new but these are uh, RE 71 RS's there is a limited uh, limited uh, amount of selection for tires in the correct uh, 225 uh, uh, 50 size with the correct speed rating. Um, uh, but we thought this was the best example. It's probably a more aggressive tire uh, than what the car had when new. Uh, and I think it's mostly sold as an autocross tire. So this car, you know, we fitted it with what we thought was the best tire regardless of price, and it turned out to be these Bridgestones, which we're, we're actually pretty happy with. They're pretty cool tires. They'll be sticky. Um, this car will not disappoint you driving around corners. Uh, I just found another mark in one of the wheels. So we got two wheels. Oh, no, it's the same wheel. There's two marks. In it. It's okay. One wheel has a couple marks. The other three wheels are uh, basically perfect. Um, again, I'll give you uh, a slow pan of the underside, and I think anybody, no idea the way this exhaust is designed, by the way, maybe somebody could put that in the comments, the purpose of that uh, appendage on the uh, side of the exhaust, I have no idea. Um, anyway, uh, we'll give you a slow pan of the underside. And I think any, per, any reasonable person uh, would agree that for the age and mileage, which is about 130,000 kilometers, the underside of this S2000 is spectacular. Now, you may, you may not care how clean the underneath of your car is because it'll get dirty, but at least when it's all cleaned up, you can see exactly what you're buying. Uh, it is not obscured by a bunch of oil and dirt, and it is not obscured by, uh, you know, a well-meaning car dealer who wants to improve the look of it by putting a bunch of spray paint over everything. So it's original finishes and not corroded. All the correct panels and fasteners in place. And uh, basically, apart from a little bit of scuffing on the lower edge of the front spoiler, you know, the whole undercarriage of the car is, uh, is beautiful. Um, it's clean enough you can eat off that right now. Okay, so a summary on this 2002 S2000. First, let me, let me say what would be important to me if I was buying an S2000, and what would be what I'd want and what I wouldn't want and what I'd try to avoid, what I'd try to look for. I, I guess what I wouldn't want is an S2000 sold to some kid who modified it, street raced it, crashed it, had it rebuilt, and then it was stolen and then it was like painted, okay? So, so those cars are out there. There's lots of 2000, S2000s that led, that led that life. Um, the person you want to buy an S2000 for would be somebody like the previous owner who was a retired airline pilot. We, we asked him when we got the car, does it, do you get a grind from a one-two shift at Redline. And he said, well, I, I don't know, I've never redlined it. It's, it's never ground, okay? So, 
you know, you've got a guy in his 70s uh, who, you know, maintains his own aircraft, maintains his own cars, and guys like that are mechanically sympathetic, okay? They don't abuse their machinery, they don't miss shifts, they don't generally, um, they don't abuse their cars, they look after things, they understand uh, proper maintenance because when you're flying that could be life or death, okay? So you, every pilot I've ever known applies that same mindset that they do with their planes to their cars, okay? So that, that, that says a lot, like right there. So we go through it and we look for accident damage and, and we don't find any. I mean, it had a rear bumper cover replaced, but nothing else. All the original panels with the VIN stickers. So that's an important one. You have a car with all of its original panels and no evidence of any sort of big variation in any of the paint depth. Maybe some of the panels got a little bit of clear and the hood was repainted, but it's all uniform. So you can be confident that there's no surprises underneath the paint uh, of the car, okay? Next, you know, you look for corrosion. So you really only see that underneath the car. And when you look under this car, uh, there's just no corrosion anywhere. You really call this car completely rust-free. Um, that isn't always the case. There's sometimes where a car looks like this, but you lift it up and you can't even get the bolts off because they're corroded so much, okay? So we've got a, a rust-free car. It's a sports car, it's low, so you know, you look for damage. Front bumper covers get cracked and the plastic pieces that line them, you know, get cracked and fall off and the, the fasteners are these little plastic press-on things and they all get lost and the car can run over things and run over curbs and get damaged on the underside. And we see that quite a bit on sports cars. Um, and so there's, there's none of that here. So you've got a completely clean under tray, all of its original panels, nothing's cracked or broken, nothing's, ro nothing's, uh, nothing's rusted. Uh, we have all of its original body panels, apart from the rear bumper cover that's plastic, with the VIN stickers on it. The interior is unmarked. Uh, the seats don't have like advanced bolster wear of any kind. The dash isn't cracked. Um, nothing is heat soaked. There's no evidence of water ingress, maybe from a leaking top. The top has been replaced. It's fitted well. It's canvas and not, and not vinyl. Uh, and uh, you know, it's okay. okay. So that if you're looking for an S2000, you know, it kind of ticks all of those boxes and it's unmodified. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling for a list of, uh, or, or, any, or any negatives on the car. Um, it has 130,000 kilometers, 128. So there are cars with, with fewer kilometers. Um, but for the mileage, uh, I don't know how you could reasonably expect to get a better example with 128,000 kilometers. In fact, it would probably be difficult to find a better example with half the mileage. It really is um, that clean. It drives perfectly. Uh, we've done uh, all the fluid changes. We put on good tires on the car that suit it. The, the, the Bridgestone, it would have had Bridgestones when it was new. And these are a really sticky summer tire. Uh, that should be a, an awful lot of fun. Don't expect a lot of tr tread wear, but it's a sports car. Uh, and, uh, and anywhere you go, that's the summary of this S2000. You could look at, you could look at a lot of S2000s and not find one that ha that's this clean, this original, abused. So with that, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. Please like and subscribe. You'd have a really difficult time having more fun for less money than this car here.